Models and theories go together. We've been working with black boxes in class, and as we investigated the box, we developed a theory and then a model. Theories are explanations of observations. So you make a whole bunch of observations about a black box, usually, and then you attempt to explain what you've seen. Because it's a black box, you can never be 100% sure that your theory is correct, but you can gain more and more confidence in your theory. Then, sometimes it's helpful to draw a model or create a model, it doesn't have to be a drawing, it can be some other representation, and the model is simplified so that it's easier to understand. So when we drew pictures of the black box, we didn't draw all of the features of the box, just the parts that were important to understanding how it worked. So here are some examples of theories and models. Here are a bunch of very famous scientific theories. You got the Big Bang Theory, which a lot of people think is a theory about how the universe began, but actually we don't know what caused the Big Bang and we don't even have any way of figuring that out. The Big Bang Theory just is a theory about what the early universe was like. So we believe, based on a lot of observations, that the early universe seems likely to have expanded outward from a very dense, hot, gaseous center. And that's really all the Big Bang Theory says, is that it started out, everything was clumped together kind of in one big hot mess, and then there was what we can think of almost as an explosion outward. And we base that theory on observations that we've made about the universe, indirect observations similar to the ones you made about your black box. So we can't be sure, but we feel strongly that after collecting lots of evidence over hundreds of years, that it really seems like the universe at one time was all clustered together in one place. You probably studied in sixth grade the tectonic plate theory. This is the theory that the surface of the Earth must be composed of plates that slowly move and that those plates are rubbing up against each other causing things like earthquakes and volcanoes and stuff like that. So the tectonic plate theory explains our observations of volcanoes. It explains our observations of earthquakes. It explains our observation that the continents appear to be pieces that are like a puzzle that seems like it should fit back together. And it seems like um, all of those things can be explained by the theory of tectonic plates. The atomic theory is basically this, that matter is made up of tiny pieces that, if not indestructible, are at least pretty close to being indestructible. We know we can split the atom, but um, atoms are the smallest piece of matter that we can think of that stays together as one unit almost all the time. We've never actually seen inside of atoms, but we're pretty sure they're there based on the behavior of, of substances and, and matter in the universe. And lots of things that happen with matter, chemical reactions and the differences between solids, liquids, and gases, things that we observe about matter can only really be explained if matter is made of pieces, and we call those pieces atoms. The theory of matter and energy are, are actually two separate theories, both called the conservation of matter and energy. And as far as we can tell, Matter and energy are both always conserved, which means that we seem to be incapable of creating new matter or new energy or making matter or energy disappear. It seems that those two things, there's a fixed amount of both in the universe. We call this a theory instead of a law because it's impossible for us to know what's going on in every corner of the universe. But based on all the observations we've been able to make to date, if we, take a, if we take some energy out of one place, it goes somewhere else. If we take some matter out of one place, it goes someplace else. Those things can never disappear. Last year, you probably studied cell theory. Um, and this is a theory that all living things are made of cells. And that may sound like, well, why is that a theory? Well, it's a theory because it's an explanation of how living things function. And even though we can actually see cells, this is still considered a theory and not really a law because it's more of an explanation than an observation. It explains how all living things reproduce, how they go through all the life functions. Then there's the theory of evolution which really I think should be called the theory of natural selection because evolution 
is an observable fact. You can see that life on Earth has changed over time and is changing to this day. But how that change has occurred, what caused it, is theoretical. Um, we try to explain how and why life on Earth has changed over time. And Darwin's theory of natural selection seems to make the most sense. So that over time, organisms um, that are best adapted to live in their environments out-survive and out-reproduce um, other organisms that are less well adapted. So what is a theory? A theory is an explanation of observations. Unlike the word theory in everyday language, theories in science are pretty well established as not necessarily facts, but as well-supported evidence-based statements. So a theory is not just a theory. A theory is a pretty serious thing in science. We don't just give the name theory to anything. So let's look at some examples of models. Here are three models that you've probably seen before. In the upper left-hand corner, this is a model of a cell. At first, it might look like a model of the planet Earth. Um, has some similarities there. But this is a three-dimensional model of a cell. We tend to think of cells as being flat because they're so small compared to us that their thickness doesn't really stand out to us. So this is actually a kind of a cool model of a cell because it shows you that it does have three-dimensional depth. And you can see like the Golgi bodies and um, the mitochondria and the lysosomes and um, the nucleus and all that stuff in there. And you probably don't even remember what each of those things does, that's okay. But um, that's a model of the cell, right? And what's the purpose of it? It makes it easier to understand. A real cell is hard to figure out because it's so complex and it's tiny. It's not big enough to look at. In the upper right-hand corner, you've got uh, um, one of many different versions of a model of an atom. Depending what part of the atom you're interested in, you might be looking at different models. This one seems to be emphasizing the nucleus with the positively charged and the um, non-charged neutrons and the positively charged protons in the center. Down at the bottom, you have a model of DNA, which is really an oversimplification because DNA is a molecule that's made up of lots of different atoms. And so this is just kind of showing you the superstructure of it. So that's it for models and theories. See you in the next tutorial.